I'm Carl Klaus. Uh, I live in Iowa City. I've uh, lived here since 1962 uh, when I came to teach at the University of Iowa. And um, I taught English uh, at the university for 35 years. And uh, every one of those years I taught writing, uh, nonfiction writing in one form or another. Uh, from uh, freshmen all the way up to doctoral students. But most of the time in uh, my uh, later years, I was uh, working with uh, uh, graduate students in the nonfiction uh, writing program. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the program that I started in, in the um, mid-1980s. Uh, and I taught until uh, uh, 1997. Uh, and a couple of years after I retired, uh, 17 years ago, I started uh, a nonfiction book series for the University Press. Uh, and uh, since I've retired, I've uh, uh, done six more nonfiction books of my own. So uh, nonfiction has been at the center of my life. Uh, and, and that's been immensely satisfying, except for the fact that uh, that I hate the word. Uh, it seems uh, uh, such a strange and negative way to talk about such a spacious and, and wonderful thing. Um, and the one thing I've not been able to do is to, is to come up with an alternative word for it. Uh, but the word at least reminds me that, uh, that it deals with actual experience. That's, what this, that's what's at the heart of it. I think, I think that the reason that there that there is bound to be an overlap, that it's inescapable, is that almost all literary nonfiction depends on memory. And uh, long-term memory especially uh, is fraught with imagination. So uh, whenever we remember something, uh, we are inescapably fictionalizing it. Uh, even though we may think we're remembering it exactly as it is. Uh, and I had a, I had a really poignant uh, experience of that uh, some uh, uh, 20 years ago when I was uh, keeping a uh, journal uh, about my garden and my life. And I was, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was called My Vegetable Love. And I was writing every day writing an entry every day. And whenever I had the incident or the observation or the scene or the conversation that I wanted to tell about, I would run up to the attic up there where my study is and I'd write it. And then uh, I would show it to my wife, Kate, who was alive then, uh, so she could give me her reaction. She was a, a writer herself, a poet and a dramatist. And almost every time that it involved some dialogue, she would say, no, that's not what I said. This is what I said. And so just in a few minutes uh, or a half an hour interval between the conversation and the writing, I had distorted it in my memory. Uh, so I think that, that there's bound to be fiction in nonfiction. We can never tell all of the actuality. Uh, we're, always, we're always choosing, selecting, editing experience in one way or another. Uh, so it's, it's unavoidable. Most often they want to know my writing habits, uh, both the students and the readers. Uh, and, and by that I mean they want to know well, how long do you write? When do you write? And, and I think that those questions are actually motivated by the fact that, that they think there's some secret. And, and if you talk to a real writer, you'll get the answer to the secret. Uh, but what I usually say is when the spirit moves me. Um, as with that journal, I would run to the attic to write the minute I had good material. 
Uh, and uh, given that I was committed to writing a 500-word essay every day, uh, uh, because I was trying to do something quite different in that. I was trying not just to have a rambling diary, but a journal that every entry consisted of a gem of an essay, a well-turned little story. So I thought of it as an essayistic journal because I wanted to see if I could make literary nonfiction about immediate actual experience. Because most uh, nonfiction writers think that, in fact, it depends on memoir, memory, long-term experience. Uh, so uh, I, have told, uh, I have told people who ask that question, whenever I've got the material, especially when I'm doing uh, a day-by-day-by-day -day -day journal, then I write. On the other hand, now I'm, uh, now I'm doing uh, something called an octogenarian's chronicle. Uh, and this is a journal of the decade of my 80s. And so the interval is not a day, but every six months. And every six months I write an essay about my thoughts about aging and my physical changes, my mental changes, what's happened to me, to my memory. And, and, uh, and those of my friends, and how quirky we're all becoming in one way or another. And so now my writing consists of kind of taking notes when, when something happens uh, to me or to uh, an, an aged friend, uh, and, or we have a conversation and uh, and it strikes me as something I want to think about and write about. I'll, I'll take some notes on it, but then I won't write it up till later, until I know how it's going to fit in the whole set of pieces. So uh, actually, when I answer that question to people, I say, well, it depends on the kind of work I'm writing as to when I'm writing and how long I'm writing. Yeah. There are no fixed rules. Oh, uh, no, not really. And, and the thing of it is, is that um, this house is so quiet and this street is so quiet, as you may have noticed, that I can write anywhere in the house. And I have written in every one of the rooms of the house. Um, and I've written out here. Uh, and if I really want to get away from it all, I go into the garden uh, because I can think out there. I mean, just when I'm working uh, in the garden, it's such a perfect distraction from everything that my, that my mind is free. And, and I, I do a lot of, I think most writers do a lot of writing in their head, uh, cogitating it, uh, turning it over. Um, uh, no, I've, I've written in almost every kind of circumstance. When I was doing that, uh, that uh, um, a year of, of my vegetable garden, uh, there were some times when I was on the road traveling. I've written in planes, trains, buses, uh, and, and um, the year I retired, my wife and I took a trip out to the Rocky Mountains, and I, I was uh, finishing a journal called uh, Taking Retirement. And that retirement trip was the climax. And so I was doing a road journal. And the real problem there was, you know, to have fun, not to be writing. Uh, so I didn't write until night, uh, until the end of the day. But then, you know, uh, when bedtime or love time was calling, I had to get in and write my 500-word uh, piece before I could hit the bed. Uh, so that was, that was hard. And the only other time it was hard was uh, two, three years later, we went to China, and we took a, 
a slow boat from Shanghai to Chongqing, the whole navigable portion of the Yangtze River. And the, the river was so spectacular. And the sampans and the junks and all the stuff uh, on that river was so captivating, I couldn't write. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It's funny. I, this little book that I uh, published last fall called The Self-Made of Words is, uh, is, is a book about creating a self out of language and how particular selections of language can affect the way you come across. And so there are a whole series of little chapters on aspects of prose style. And one of the, one of the ones, the chapters, was called Nouns and Verbs versus Adjectives and Adverbs. Uh, and um, I was uh, writing about how uh, adjectives can really poison, uh, adverbs can really poison a piece of prose. Uh, uh, or as uh, Stephen King once said, the road to hell is paved with adverbs. Well, darn if that piece that I was writing, writing wasn't paved with adverbs. And so when I started going back, it made me nervous. So I went back and looked at the other chapters and they were paved with adverbs. So I had to clean them, clean them out of the whole book. Um, well, since then, I've, I've dealt with that problem. But actually, what I find is that every time I do a book, there's some set of words or phrases that I begin to lean on. And and so, if, if, I, if I had to revise Stephen King, I would say that the road to hell is paved with writing ticks, the ticks that come up in any particular work that you lean on like a crutch. Uh, I'm sure that's uh, probably how it is uh, with you in, in doing video, that you, that you lean on certain things yeah, uh, too some much. Literally, of course, it, it means the mask that, that somebody wears. Uh, and I think that uh, consciously or not, we're, we're always uh, um, shifting uh, roles uh, depending on who we happen to be with. I mean, I'm not the same person with you that that I am with my partner Jackie, uh, or that uh, uh, that I am with my editor, or that I am with my publisher. I mean, every every person I'm with calls forth a different person in me. It's inescapable, and so uh, it, it seems to me that that uh, although many people like to say that they're, that they're uh, searching f f for a voice or finding a voice. Uh, my feeling is that there is no single voice that defines anyone, not even, uh, not even uh, the people who seem to have a more distinctive voice than others, like uh, Joan Didion, who, uh, who's uh, a, a supreme master of anaphora, uh, which is to say beginning a series of sentences with the exact same phrase or the exact same word. And it produces a kind of hauntingly echoic style. Uh, but over time, uh, uh, Didion herself changes. And so I think that, that, that um, probably in order to be truest to ourselves and to the subjects we write about and to the people we're writing for, uh, we had best uh, ad adjust ourselves uh, from piece to piece to piece. Uh, and, and so are true to ourselves in that moment. Uh, although somebody might say, uh, well, uh, this is a, a falsehood. Uh, but it's, 
It depends on whether, of course, you believe in some kind of essentialist personality uh, and uh, uh, some, some kind of core, unchanging personality uh, that's uh, manifest in all times and all places for all people. And uh, I guess I don't believe that. I mean, when I was teaching, uh, spring break, Christmas break, the summer, summer session were all times to recharge myself. But now that I've been retired for 17 years, I, I don't feel that compelling need to, to recharge. If anything, the way I recharge myself is to, uh, is to start a new project. There's nothing like a new project to, to recharge me. I, when I did that little book, um, uh, A Self Made of Words, uh, I, I did it as a way of recovering from cancer. You may recall when you first asked me, I was, I was in the cancer ward as it was. And, uh, and doing that little book was a, a way of, of recharging myself. And, and I did it in about a year and a half. And when I finished it, um, I recharged myself by starting the Octogenarian's Chronicle. A completely different project, uh, and uh, that that different kind of landscape, different subject, different landscape. That's what really recharged me. Elation is what I feel. But you know something? Uh, when it's over, it's over. And um, when the book is published, it's dead on arrival for me. And, and so that for me the the excitement is always in the midst of the writing uh, when I don't yet know how to do the book uh, because every book uh, calls forth uh, uh, something different from you uh, makes different demands on you and you have to learn how to write it and it's in learning how to write the book you're writing that the excitement resides. Uh, so when I finish the book, I've solved the problems. Uh, I've solved them actually long before I've finished the book. Uh, so there's, there are, in a sense, no more surprises. Um, once upon a time, I thought about uh, writing a book about my childhood because I had a very strange childhood. Um, my father died when I was two and my mother died when I was six and so I was orphaned by the time I was six and then I went to live with a, an uncle who was the brother of my father uh, and he died when I was 11. And uh, then I went to live with another uncle, another brother of my father's, and he turned out to be a monstrously Dickensian person. And so uh, I, I grew up in, in a very bizarre world, moving from one relative to another. Uh, and and obviously it's it's made me different from many people. I I don't have the kind of uh, attachments uh, that people have who have had the full life with their parents. And so when I see people undone by their parents, uh, even when they're in their 40s or 50s, how how mature people can be torn apart by the way their parents treat them. I think, well, this is really bizarre. But that's only because I don't, I don't have those nuts and bolts in me. Do you see what I mean? So I've, I once thought I could do such a book, but I, I, I never did it. Uh, I've alluded to these facts. Uh, from time to time in other works, but 
I've I've never I've never lived with it at length at the length I would have to to write such a book and and I and I don't want to go back there and relive that. When I was younger, I was immensely influenced by several of the essayists whom I was teaching. Um, I was I was influenced by E. B. White. Uh, I I wanted to write that that plain, uh, unvarnished, wry, witty down east style. Uh, I was influenced by Didion. I wanted I wanted to have that echoic style. I was I was influenced by by George Orwell. Uh, I wanted to tell it like it is, uh, but but finally, um, I find I found my own way of writing, um, and and I found it not just by uh, by living with a number of wonderful essayists and just letting them seep into my veins. Uh, but also by uh, unlearning everything I had learned in graduate school um, about writing. Because if you've taken a doctorate, uh, you'll learn all of that academic jargon, and you, you have to unlearn it. And it was, uh, it was a long time uh, unlearning all that. Yes, yeah, I, I, uh, I certainly do. Uh, I would say not that it in any sense involves the heavenly host <laughs> or anything in a kind of uh, uh, traditional religious sense of spiritual, but uh, In other senses, I certainly do believe that. Um, first of all, um, almost every one of the books that I've written has come to me um, in a sudden moment of, I'm going to write this book, like The Descent of the Muse. Uh, I can remember, for example, the very day I was sitting up in the TV room on the second floor, a week after my wife had died, and I was sitting in what had been her chair, and I put my hand down, and I came up with a tablet of hers on which she would write poems late at night. And I opened up the tablet, and without even thinking about it, I started to write her a letter, telling her what had gone on the past few days. And from that day on for another full year, I wrote her a letter every day, uh, which was published as Letters to Kate. Well, in that sense, it's multiply spiritual in the first case because of the kind of uh, otherworldly way in which I c came to write that letter. And then in the other sense of invoking her spirit every day by the very act of writing to her. Um, and I also think that uh, whenever we're doing a personal essay or a memoir, we're always telling not just a story of experience, uh, but a story of thought and feeling. Uh, not, just, uh, not just an outer story, but an inner story, and that inner story is, is surely uh, a spiritual in its dimension. So yes, I, I certainly do think that's so. Well, I don't think you have to publish books to be one. I think that uh, I think that anybody who writes often 
and, and cares enough about their writing to fuss over it, uh, uh, who may do nothing more than uh, write letters but, uh, but care about the quality of the writing or uh, write journals and not publish them, keep the journals just for the purpose of keeping them, but again, who worries about the quality of the writing, those people are writers. Uh, uh, so, uh, I mean, I, I don't think there is such a thing as a, a capital W writer. There's so much um, nowadays, so much more insecurity on the part of people about writing uh, that whenever they do encounter somebody who's a professional writer, then, oh, you're a writer, you know, and uh, all of that awe stuff begins uh, uh, to start circling around you. And, and, and they feel uncomfortable suddenly because, oh, I've got to watch myself. Uh, and, and I think it's because uh, uh, in the schools, uh, writing has become uh, a less natural and comfortable experience than it could be. Everybody's worrying about whether they got it right or wrong, uh, rather than whether they're speaking from their heart or their mind. Mm -hmm.